gone into hiding and cut off the communication between him and God. Again and again, Job looked at heaven and he shook his fist and he challenged God to come out. But it was like talking to somebody maybe on a telephone and suddenly you realize there's no communication and you suspect that that person is no longer there, that they put the phone down. They haven't hung up the receiver. They just put the phone down and aren't saying anything. Well, that's how this Canaanite woman probably felt. She told Jesus that her daughter was sick and needed help. And all she got in reply was a look. No word of sympathy, no word of encouragement, just a look. And the disciples, boy, they were a big help. They said, they said to Jesus that he should send her away, that he should just do away with her and get her out of his hair. And he listened, they said, see how she comes shouting after us. But you remember, they said the same thing when there were 5,000 people there on that hill in Galilee that were hungry. And they said, what are we going to do? We need to send them away. They said the same thing when there was a poor crippled man by the pool at Bethesda. And they said, he cried out. And they said, send him away. Even when the children folks tried to come to see Jesus, the disciples tried to send so many of them away. And sadly, this has been frequently the church's response to human suffering. Send them away. Send them to prisons. Send them to welfare organizations. Send them anywhere. Just, we don't have time to be bothered. And the disciples, like the church today, and that's capital C, not just any church, the church had become fatigued under the constant pressure of all the demands that the world made upon them. So part of this woman's faith was that she would not be put off. She would not be totally discouraged by the indifference of the people. And the disciples didn't seem to be the only ones that were putting this little lady off. When Jesus finally did break his silence with her, he said, I have been sent to the house of Israel and to them alone. Now, to that Canaanite woman, that would have been something not pleasant to hear. The question is, was Jesus testing her when he said that? And we really don't know. But as I looked at this and looked at different commentaries, it sounds like as if he's saying, sorry, honey, you're just not a religious woman. But even then, with that in mind, she refused to get discouraged and be put off. In spite of what Jesus said, she fell at his feet and she cried out, Sir, help me. That was the strength, the essence of her faith. And she may not have belonged to the synagogue and she surely knew very, very little about Torah, but she had a need, a deep need. And that was enough. So that brings us to the third point of her faith. She realized that she really had no claim, no claim whatsoever on Jesus for the correct request that she was making. To this woman's plea for help, Jesus makes another statement that we, I, have difficulty in understanding. And it really doesn't sound like anything that Jesus would say. He said to her, it is not right to take children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, that sounds like a contemptuous insult to me. Even today, the term dog is used for something that's not particularly good. You know, he's dogging it. She's such a dog, you know. So 
that's what was going on here, but the commentators point out that the actual word Jesus used was not dog, but puppy. He was referring to that little household pet that I've got, my Rosa. We've all got some, most of us have some kind of pet at home, and that's what he was talking about. He wasn't referring to the wild dog that roamed the streets. Some say that he was not insulting her, but that he was playing with her, and that he was teasing her. One commentator said he probably even had a smile on his face when he spoke these words. And as I looked at it, and I looked at that comment, and I looked at it, and I looked at that comment, I'm not sure I agree with him, because I think what he's doing is drawing lines here. His ministry, I think he's saying, is not to the Gentiles. And we can certainly understand it that way. But if at this point, the poor woman, we would understand it, if she had burst into tears, thrown her hands up in despair, and just simply walked away. But she didn't cry. She did not walk away. She answered Jesus with these words. It is true, sir. I admit that I'm a dog. I realize I have no claim upon you. That was her faith. And that is still what faith is all about today. It's faith for us to go to God for help. And at the same time, we admit that we have no claim upon Him. There's not a thing that I've ever done or you've ever done that will earn the mercy He gives to us. We are in no position to make demands on God, but we still go to Him with all the faith in the world. And then the woman said to Jesus, Sir, even the dogs eat the scraps from the master's table. And she was saying, in effect, Sir, I admit that I have no business coming to you. I have no claim upon you. But there must be, and I love this term that I read from one of the commentators, there must be some small extra grace that you have that I might be deserving of. And that rang Jesus' bell. And he looked at her, and just like I could hear the tone of his voice in something a little while ago, I can now see the look in his face. He looked at her, and he said, Woman, what great faith you have be as it is you wish. And from that moment, guess what? The little girl was healed. She was restored to her health. Well, the greatness of this lady's faith consists of three things. First of all, her willingness. Her willingness to cross the barrier of racism and nationalism and all of that that stood between her people and the Jews. The second thing is she refused to be ignored or to be put off because of who she was and her position in life. She didn't have money. She didn't have a big house. She didn't have much of anything but a little girl who was her life, just like our children become our lives. And thirdly, she had humility, a tremendous amount of humility. And admitting that she did not deserve Jesus' attention and time. And there's an old hymn, very old hymn, that I want us to think about as I close. It's by a man named William Bathurst. And he wrote two verses the last two verses of this hymn. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by many a foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath 
that chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon God. Will lean upon God. That's when we show our faith. Is when we put ourselves away. When we get over it ourselves. When we understand we can't do it by ourselves. I want to change the closing hymn this morning. Turn with me to number 560. Great, great old hymn of the church. What is faith? Was, is, it was the title of my sermon. And I answer that with the title of this hymn. What is faith? It's when we lean on the everlasting arms of Christ. Let's stand and sing number 560. Let's sing the first and last stanzas.